Coming up next on this week in computer hardware, 7.1 billion transistors. Sounds awesome, but NVIDIA's new GPU is for servers, not your gaming machine. Audio VCs, upgradable SSD, AMD's latest APU for laptops, and more. It's all coming up next on Twitch. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twitch. Bandwidth for Twitch is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware, episode 170, recorded May 17th, 2012, 7.1 billion transistors on a single chip. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ford, giving customers the power of choice with a full line of electric and hybrid electric vehicles. Learn more about Ford electric vehicle technologies at Ford.com slash technology. And by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to squarespace.com and use offer code TWITCH5. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. Welcome to Twitch This Week in Computer Hardware. I'm Patrick Norton, and Twitch is the show where we try to give you everything you need to know about the latest news in PC hardware and a little bit of the tablet stuff, too. I'm joined, as always, by the ever so hardworking Mr. Ryan Shrout, who is probably bleeding from the eye sockets from yet another round of high-intensity benchmarking. How are you doing, man? Um, well, I, I, haven't, I, did, I have to say I didn't do any benchmarking yet this week. Uh, I spent the majority of my time Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday out in your direction in San Jose, downtown San Jose, uh, going to the NVIDIA GPU Technology Conference, which is the source of uh, a lot of the, the, the stories we're actually going to talk about today. So... Um, Benchmarking to resume tomorrow, I guess. <laughs> Benchmarking and eye bleeding. Well, we, should, we should probably talk about the biggest thing uh, that kind of came out of the woodwork of the NVIDIA announcements, the uh, GK110 GPU Kepler. At Brace yourselves, ladies and gentlemen. One, excuse me, 7.1 billion transistors, uh, 15 SMX units. This is not something we're going to be running in our desktop machines to play video games. Let us make this abundantly clear immediately uh yeah well at least <laughs> not for a while right so uh, kepler is the is the architecture we we saw the first kepler gpus come out uh, already uh, this year in the form of the gtx 680 and then the 690 and then the 670 and those are all based off of a chip with the code name of gk 104 now if you're a a kind of a hardcore hardware nerd you, if you follow code names and what they typically mean in the nvidia world a 100 is like the biggest chip it's the first one of it and then the derivatives come out at 104 106 107 and the and they lose features they lose performance you know 104 is a little bit smaller than 100 106 is, is more small 107 is a little smaller than that and you get down into the you know the budget range parts Right. Uh, what was interesting with this, with the GTX 6A releases that came out with GK104, uh, G standing for GeForce or graphics and K standing for Kepler, uh, but we never saw GK100. And then, so that's still kind of a mystery as to if that chip ac actually existed, if maybe they had problems with it, they had to scrap it. The, sh the, the GPU that they unveiled this week at the tech GPU technology conference is GK110. And uh, we would typically think of that uh, if we look at the past generation of graphics cards, the GTX 480 was GF100. That was the first Fermi architecture. And GF110 was the GTX 580. So you, you kind of see where people expected there to be a GK100 because of the, of the, of the steppings, but it didn't really happen. Um, now, as NVIDIA has announced it, GK110 is going to be a Tesla graphics chip. Right, it's going to be a Tesla processor. They didn't announce Quadro parts. They didn't talk about GeForce parts. They only talked about seeing GK110 in a Tesla card. Um, and probably the most interesting statistic right off of the bat, and I'm actually trying to find um, how many. So GK104 had 3.5 billion transistors. The new GK110 chip has 7.1 billion transistors it's uh i think i think their ceo claimed that it was the most 
complex microprocessor ever built, including like Intel's like high end titanium based processors in terms of like transistor counts and that kind of stuff. I mean, it's it's an enormous part. It has 15 SMX units, which are these kind of divisions inside the GPU uh, that NVIDIA created with Kepler. Uh, Each of those has 192 single precision shader cores in it stream processors, whatever you want to call them, uh, to bring the total of this architecture up to 2,880 cores, uh, which is a lot. That, that's compared to the 1,536 in the GTX 680. So we're going from 8 SMX units to 15 SMX units, almost double, not quite double. And uh, we're basically doubling the transistor count. This is going to be an enormous chip. Mm-hmm. Um and it's going to be incredibly expensive. <laughs> and they're, I think they're even saying that don't even really expect to see it in the Tesla parts until Q4 2012. Um, so, you know, do I think they'll make a, a consumer version of this? I would say they probably will eventually. Will it be before the Tesla is released or after? I would, If I were to guess, I would say after. Um, I, I would think NVIDIA sees this GPU as kind of its insurance policy. GK104, the GTX 680 is already outperforming the HD 7970, the highest end parts from AMD. So they don't really need a faster single GPU solution in their in their GeForce in their consumer market space. So if AMD comes up with something, if AMD releases a new part like in September or October that happens to push the performance metrics even further, right? They beat out the 680. Um, NVIDIA has something they can fall out, fall back to. They can release this as a 12 SMX part, you know, and still, you know, get somewhere between 30 and 40% better performance than the GTX 680. You know, they have that possibility. Um, they don't really have a naming scheme set up for it. This, it's also possible that this will be the part start of the 700 series, of GeForce cards. You know, this could be the GTX 780 down the road. We really don't have any idea. Um, But it's, I mean, they they didn't talk about clock speeds. They didn't talk about uh, die size. They didn't talk about, you know, heat and performance issues. They did say that it was the most power efficient GPU they've ever built in terms of, you know, performance per watt and that type of thing. But again, they're aiming this at server clusters, super high performance computing, you know, uh, scientific and research fields and those types of things. That, and the benefit to them is, right, we're talking about all the availability issues they have with GTX 680 today. They can sell each one of these GPUs for like $5,000, right? So they, they can make up a lot of uh, yield issues uh, in terms of profit margin simply by being able to charge this much for a GPU uh, to those specific mar- markets. You know, and these GPUs... Also the yields are good and they can turn out enough. You know what I mean? Like, like sure. you still have to, you have, still have to make this. I mean, this is, this is to, just to put this into context for anybody who's maybe not up to speed on the itanium and transistor counts and stuff like, so this new NVIDIA part, 7.1 billion transistors. It's like, almost at the maximum, um, I think it's like what they call the reticle maximum, basically the maximum size of the die at this point, 550 millimeters. That's a 23 millimeter by 23 millimeter <laughs> chip, which is yeah. huge. That's like early 1990s huge. The Itanium, which is Intel's most complicated processor, um, the 64-bit uh, 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 CPUs that are designated for enterprise servers, massive, big iron, full-on unhinged, honking servers those are about 3.1 billion transistors the core i7 the ivy bridge cpus are running about 1.4 billion transistors 7.1 billion transistors is ridiculous it is an incredible incredible insane number that's like twice as many that's used in in most of the top gpus right now so I i think it's gonna be interesting to see what the yields like on these too I don't imagine they're going to be very good. Now, they can, they can improve <laughs> their yields by lowering their target clock speed. The consumer version of the 680 runs at 1,000 megahertz, right? So if they clock this at 700 megahertz or something like that, then they're able to, to save a lot more chips. And kind of like the server world in general, they're maybe not necessarily as, as interested in, in how fast you are uh, – uh, as how how deep you can process, kind of, I'm trying to think of a good analogy, how deep you process in terms of clock speed, but how wide you can process in terms of how many shaders, how many cores you can have running at the same time, right? So 
Um, they'll have different SKUs, I'm sure. And, and if they if they have to clock at 650 megahertz to run, you know, 2,600, 2,700, 2,800 cores at the same time, I think there'll there will still be buyers for these parts in the high performance computing market. And these GPUs, they're a little bit bigger, they're a little bit more complex even than the the 680s because they have uh, much better performance and double precision math, which is very important for uh, high performance computing and scientific computing. Not really important for gaming. Um, uh, they have they introduced they introduced a bunch of new stuff that I'm not going to dive into here, like dynamic parallelism. The ability for the GPU now has the capability to spawn its own work. So before mm-hmm. you might have to the uh, the CPU would have to manage everything. Right here's a bunch of work. Report back results. Okay, these results say that we need to spawn more work to the GPU. Do it and go back and forth. Now coders, developers, and software programmers will be able to write code that says, well, if the GPU can determine that we need to do more GPU work, it can spawn its own thread. So that's kind of cool. It's never really been done before. And it creates a lot of unique possibilities, a lot of different possibilities for what the GPU can do. Um, uh, they have the ability to accept 32 simultaneous task queues as opposed to one that they had last generation, right? So the idea is uh, more of the GPU will be utilized for this high performance computing and that kind of stuff. So there's there's a lot of interesting stuff that they have done with GK110. And it's impressive just from a technological standpoint to see a 7 billion transistor near the size of the maximum size of the reticle chip, right? Uh, that That may see its way to a consumer market, though... I don't think it's, it's not going to be anytime soon. It may be, it's possible it could happen like just at the end of this year, more than likely it would happen in 2013. So, you know, we, we've already seen people in the comments and stuff talking about, uh, well, this is the one I'm going to wait for. And I really don't think that's, that's a stance you should even take because they, they're not even really committing to making this a GeForce product down the road. Uh, and, and they're always going to make better parts. It's just a matter of what you're going to do. But, you know, if you look at the block diagram of this chip versus 680, I mean, it's just impressive how much processing power they have on this die. So it, it was interesting. It's, it's funny because the the, the, one of the other big announcements was the, uh, the VGX, uh, which are add-on cars, essentially server add-on cars that are designed as virtualized GPUs. And all I can think of is like, wow, is this, is this a, a, a graphics card for servers to be attached to virtual machines to accelerate graphics rendering. So I'm like, is this the on live card? And then you you sort of stroll down a little bit, and uh, <laughs> and the article is like, essentially, employees can now access a true cloud PC from any device, thin client, laptop, tablet, or smartphone, regardless of its operating system, and enjoy a responsive experience for the full spectrum of applications previously only available on an office PC. Um, you know, which is like classic, you know, uh, classic PR language, but basically, right. Um, you know, the idea is, is uh, it's it's funny. There's a lot of what I will graciously call forward-looking thinking here. Uh, integrating the VGX platform into the corporate network also enables enterprise IT departments to address the complex challenges of BYOD, employees bringing their own computer device to work. It delivers a remote <laughs> desktop to these devices. It's kind of funny. It's like the idea is that you're going to give a, a similar experience, whether somebody's like on the iPhone they brought into the office or if they're on a, you know, whatever platform, whatever notebook, whatever they're bringing. Um, but it's interesting that the idea that, 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 that NVIDIA sees a market for virtualizing desktops and accelerating the graphics. I mean, it's kind of funny. It's like, you know, everybody's looking over, oh, you know, on live rendering, they're rendering games in the cloud. Why can't we render your office applications in the cloud? <laughs> right. It, it, there, there's, it's, you know, virtualization has been right. around forever. It's, it is yes. the way things are working, right? Um, right. I didn't really, I guess it, I'd never really, it's, it's not really a topic I cover real deeply, but, you know, they kind of explained it as um, until this GPU and this kind of platform they released, the VGX platform uh, was announced, there was no way to utilize GPU processing in a virtualized environment. The only way you could do that was with a one-to-one relationship. So if you had a virtual machine, it could access the GPU, but only that virtual machine could access the GPU. There was no way to divide the GPU uh, memory or performance up amongst different virtual machines. Right. And, you know, it, for, for consumers and gamers and that kind of stuff uh, on your local hardware, it's not, it may be not anything that uh, is really important, but for the enterprise market, it's Based on the, just the partners that we talked to, not even just NVIDIA themselves, obviously it's going to be a big deal from NVIDIA, but you know, their partners talking about how just it, it could drastically change how huge enterprises uh, 
you know, divide their machines up. You don't have to have um, a GPU in every machine anymore. If a user needs to access the power of a GPU to do CAD rendering, um, you know, they can they can start a virtual machine from a server, have access to a complete GPU or a portion of a GPU and and do it dynamically, right? And one of the other, one of the other ideas that really clicked for me that I thought, okay, this is going to be a big deal for business. Um, if you have a centralized server area, that has the ability to share GPU horsepower, and you've, if you're an international business, you could now put those GPUs that would to work 24 hours a day. You can have people in the U.S. working on them on their shift and people in India working on them on their shift and people in uh, Europe working on them on their shift, and you don't have to – you have to buy a third less GPUs now, right? right? And that, that kind of control that it gives businesses and enterprises is – I think really impressive and it's, it's, you know, they've been able to do this with CPU horsepower for a while. They're now going to be able to do that with, with GPU horsepower. Um, so it's, it's probably beyond what most of our users are going to implement in their own systems for now. Uh, but if they're in the IT business and they're in the IT world and, and you work with VMs a lot, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of people in our chat room that work with VMs on a daily basis. And it's like, you, you see some of these capabilities that you'll be able to do now and it could be pretty impressive. And then they did build, it's like, they, you know, they have this four GPU graphics card that they built on Kepler, right? And they're not giving it to gamers, right? But you're kind of like, hey, mm-hmm. there's a card that has four GPUs on it. Why can't we have that? But it's, been, you know, it's just built for this kind of really dense server market. But it's yeah, it's it's, it's, it's not cool exactly what you're looking for. It's funny because they talk about Citrix and server integration, and and I, you know, I probably said online, uh, on live more times in the last five minutes than I have in the last five months. But <laughs> like the other announcement. Uh, uh, was at the GPU Technology Conference was the GeForce Grid cloud gaming platform, um, you know, and of course like uh, like Gaikai Otoy. I'm not familiar with Gaikai and Otoy, but the Gaikai is actually started by Dave Perry, uh-huh. or, uh, MDK, okay, uh, big big game development guy, um, and he's kind of the the head of Gaikai. They they don't have near the marketing. Powerhouse, I guess, that OnLive has because you see OnLive everywhere. They're advertising and, and all that kind of stuff. But Gaikai is apparently a pretty big deal at it too. Uh, partnerships with LG. Um, their biggest deal, I guess, now is uh, you're going to be able to go to Walmart.com and start playing games immediately, like buy access to it on Walmart.com and just load it up in your browser, that mm-hmm. type of thing. Um, so I agree that in terms of <clears throat> in terms of names, they are a little bit less known. Uh, but they seem to have some impressive stuff. So the, cool. the grid technology basically takes that virtualization idea and applies it to games, mm-hmm. right? So imagine it's it's basically on live technology, the same idea, cloud gaming. They render it on a server. They're basically streaming you an H.264 video stream. Uh, obviously, the big issue that I have with cloud gaming and most people that have tried it that are kind of, you know, PC gamers naturally we'll see that the latency problems are uh, pretty dramatic usually. There's a, there's a graph towards the bottom of the first page of the article that looks at game latency. And there, there are some uh, differences that NVIDIA says that they've been able to make. Um, some of them I agree with and some of them I don't. <laughs> so, um, you know, they say they can lessen the capture and encode latency from 30 milliseconds down to 10 by... Uh, doing the capture and encode and process all in the GPU as opposed to having to pass it off to a CPU to encode and send out. Okay, sure, fine, I'll buy that. Uh, The decode, they also have lessened from 15 to 5 if you're using an NVIDIA GPU on the other end, even a lower-end NVIDIA GPU. Now, the the network latency you'll see drops from 75 milliseconds to 30 milliseconds, and that is no function of NVIDIA's. That is completely a function of if they can get more server farms around the country, they'll be closer to you. Therefore, your latency will drop. And I'm like, okay, that's fine. That's kind of like a pie in the sky answer in my opinion. But uh, <laughs> sure, if we have, I think Gaikai has 24 uh, stations throughout the country. If we double that to 48, they're saying we could get down to 30 milliseconds for almost every person in the U.S. Okay, that's, that's just capital investment. The, the other one, the one that I kind of have an issue with, it's like the game pipeline going from 100 milliseconds to 50 milliseconds. This is their, their claiming because they're running on Kepler GPUs that they'll be able to render things much faster than you can on a console. 
uh, or on current generation GPUs used for cloud gaming. And because of that, you are seeing a decrease if you're going from, let's say, 30 millisecond frame times to 15 millisecond frame times that you are increasing your user response time by that amount. Therefore, your game pipeline latency is a little bit less. And there's some there's some validity there, but it's 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 kind of iffy in my hand because if you ask the <laughs> average gamer, if you ask the average gamer, can you get do you think you'll be able to get cloud gaming to feel more responsive than sitting in front of a TV with a console? I think the answer is going to be no. Yeah, I I I, I not going to argue one bit with you on that one, but Nvidia is certainly excited uh, <laughs> about their new products and want to sell lots of them. I mean, you know, it's a press release. Yeah. It is, you know, I, 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 you know, this, and this also may work for like today's generation of consoles, but you know, is there going to be a next generation of console? Will it be PC gaming? Will people move right. on to virtualized gaming in the cloud? There's a whole lot of interesting things coming up in the gaming community over the next five years. Um, I think there's a good chance, too, that NVIDIA is doing this because they have missed out on this console refresh. I don't know this for sure, but I'm pretty sure, based on what I'm reading, that uh, NVIDIA won't be in any of the next generation consoles. So, And they're not going to get that license money. They're not going to get that. So here's, what, here's how they attack console gaming with this kind of virtualized console. And they showed an LG TV that supports the Gaikai service. Um, with just a network cable. We don't have to have any device. The, the support for it is built into the TV itself. Um, and, that, and that's pretty cool. And, and the idea of cloud gaming being able to upgrade hardware so you can support better features, there's, there's, there are some cool advantages. It just needs to be proven to me that cloud gaming can work in terms of user experience. And in my experience as doing it, uh, it has been unsuccessful yeah, well, so far. I think the- the problem with cloud gaming is the internet, which no matter how fast their low latency frame buffer reads, no matter how fast their integrated hardware encoder spits out H.264, right. you still have to fight your way through the internet, which is often a difficult place to move quickly. <laughs> or reliably. And then there's the whole data cap issues and there's, there's all kinds of problems that can crop up. You know what doesn't have problems? You know what's reliable? You know what's efficient? Ford's new electric car. I want one of these so badly, dude, to drive to work. That's in. right, Patrick. <laughs> That's right. This episode of This Week in Computer Hardware is brought to you by Ford, giving customers the power of choice with a full line of electric and hybrid electric vehicles. You're luckier than me. You, you're out in the Bay Area. You get like invited to these types of events where you get to drive and try these out. I live in Kentucky and, well, most of the time I live in Kentucky and uh, I don't get invited. <laughs> Have you seen those. my rents? <laughs> That's true. Yeah, that's that's a plus. Um, so Ford does have two new electric vehicles, the 2012 Ford Focus Electric and the 2013 Ford Fusion Energy Plug-in Hybrid. Uh, both these models make use of a suite of driver information systems like onboard and offboard uh, to help manage the recharge process, determine the most eco-friendly driving route, uh, which is an interesting way to think about driving, not just in terms of uh, how much time it takes you to get there, or how much distance you travel, but how eco-friendly those distances and times are. Uh, remotely control vehicle charge and preconditioning settings. You can monitor battery state of charge, uh, maximize your energy efficiency. A unique execution uh, of the technology that we've talked about before with my Ford Touch Driver Connect technology. It's uh, optimized for electrified driving by configuring vehicle information such as fuel level, battery power level, and average and instant miles per gallon. Uh, there's a Feature where much energy you capture with the regenerative uh, braking system after each full stop and what effect it's had on your range. Uh, that's kind of interesting just to, to know and, and, and see in real time. The regenerative braking system can capture over 90% of the energy lost while you're braking. That's actually pretty, pretty impressive. The system sends energy to a battery pack for later use, and it includes unique sync with my Ford Touch EV features to help you maximize your range. Um, what else we got? My Ford mobile access to Ford website and smartphone app uh, allows you to access vehicle status from your smartphone, state of charge, current range. You can look on your phone uh, and see if your car is fully charged or ready to go in the morning. You can program charge settings and download vehicle data for analysis. Um, there's lots of stuff on this. Value charging feature powered by Microsoft allows Ford customers to take advantage of off-peak or reduce from their utility company without a complicated setup process. The all-new 2012 Ford Focus Electric is a 100% electric, gas-free car. Uh, You'll never need an oil change ever, which is kind of interesting to think about. I guess I never 
thought about that with electric vehicles either. Uh, it features a powerful state-of-the-art battery. It's rated the most fuel-efficient five-passenger vehicle in America. It gets 110 miles per gallon. MPGE. Patrick, can you explain what MPGE means? Because I don't. <laughs> You know, the, every time I try to explain the miles per gallon electric, I, I start doing the math and then I get into to really okay. uh, complicated. But basically, I will attempt to explain it for everybody watching. The idea is that you want a comparison between miles per gallon, mm -hmm. which is a standard measurement for fuel economy here in the United States. And then they have a miles per gallon equivalent. Um, gotcha. So MPGE was put together by the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, quote, to compare energy consumption of alternative fuel vehicles, plug-in electric vehicles, and other advanced technology vehicles, the fuel economy of conventional internal combustion vehicles as expressed in, as miles per U.S. gallon. Now, I'm going to dig through the Wikipedia entry and see if I can get it correct. Uh, the EPA's formula says 33.7 kilowatt hours of electricity is equivalent to a gallon of gasoline in the energy consumption of each vehicle during EPA's five standard drive cycle tests simulating varying driving conditions. Um, mm. So where did it go? Where did it go? Uh, the idea, though, is that you, you, they, they basically have decided. It's comparative. It's, okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's an attempt. It, it, you know, mileage ratings are comparative to begin with because they sure. aren't run in the real world. They're run based on a formula <laughs> after running a standard course on a uh, dynamometer with the vehicle. Right. So what they call the drive cycle test. But so I could talk about this for so long, we would miss the end of Twitch and our opportunity. We to don't want to do that. Cool. Uh, so 100, 110 <laughs> miles per gallon equivalent or miles per gallon electric. It has a uh, best-in-class driving range of 76 miles, <clears throat> and it has the best-in-class 240-volt charge time. In fact, the 2012 Ford Focus Electric can be fully charged in about four hours when connected to the optional 240-volt home charging station. That's about half the time it takes to charge the Nissan Leaf. The 2012 Ford Focus Electric is available for purchase now at EV certified dealers. And the 2013 Ford Fusion Energy Plug-in Hybrid is coming early 2013 and is projected to achieve a combined fuel efficiency rating of over 100 miles per gallon equivalent. Learn more about the electric technologies Ford is bringing to its vehicles at Ford.com slash technology. Mm -hmm. And we thank Ford for their support of uh, This Week in Computer Hardware and the entire TWIT network. It's been an interesting uh, six months or so for AMD. <laughs> They've been fighting. Uh, and, and in some ways, I think we've talked about it on the show where it seems like AMD has kind of accepted that they're no longer going to compete with Intel at the high end, but they are going to look for, you know, either mass, you know, huge, inexpensive markets that they can target uh, to keep uh, things rolling there. But it's been interesting. The the AMD A-Series came out this week. Um, and it's... it's uh, <laughs> we need to talk about scrolling over the PC per website and getting giant uh, Conterra ads blocking everything. <laughs> the, uh, um, the idea is that uh, instead of Bulldozer, we're getting pile driver on the new AMD APUs. Yes. And so it's the third generation of AMD's uh, Turbo Core and, quote, promises up to 29% better processor performance than last year's Lano-based A-series. Um, so it's interesting. Um, yeah, the, the Lano processor, which was the first APU, didn't use bulldozer cores. It actually used cores from the Athlon series. So this is yeah. the first bulldozer architecture to make its way into uh, an APU. Um, so because of that, you, we do see a little bit of uh, performance increase on the x86, just your standard processing core side. Plus, the frequencies are a little bit higher as well. So you do get a benefit there. But then, you know, the primary focus has always been on the GPU side, right? Still there? Yeah, I, I couldn't. The, the audio cut off. Oh, well, I was, saying, I, I was just saying that the, the, the primary focus really of the APU has always been on the GPU side of things, right? That's where people kind of uh, think that the APU stands out from the Intel competition like Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge. So, I mean, uh, it's... A Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, it was interesting looking at the, the battery life benchmarks. It seems like that's probably the one place. Obviously, it, it's, a, it's a test mule from, from AMD. It's not a shipping model. Um, right. But it looked like it was a reasonably sized, like a 62-watt-hour battery, which isn't too huge. Um, bigger than, say, the... like I don't want to say we see a lot of 40-watt-hour batteries in notebooks, but the battery life uh, in like the reader's test was pretty impressive. 
like mm-hmm. seven hours, three hours, 42 in the, in the basic peacekeeper battery test. I mean, are you, are you thinking that battery life is going to be one of the advantages of the new APU? Uh, or is it just yes. too early to tell? I think it's, I think it's too early to, to get a definitive answer, but I think, um, because this is, this is kind of like a reference system and it's really not fair to give battery life estimates based on that because it, even, even on the Intel side, it varies from model to model, right? Um, so in our testing, we actually got really, really good results with the Trinity system. And this is actually the 35 watt Trinity. Uh, processor, not the 17 watt Trinity processor. So the 17 watt part will obviously get better battery life at lower performance levels. Um, but I think seven over seven hours in the uh, reader test that we use at uh, PC Perspective for uh, performance only bested only by the Lano reference system from uh, a year ago or so. And uh, for comparison, I think our Ivy Bridge system had just under five hours. So uh, Trinity does look to have better uh, battery life than Ivy Bridge as it exists today. But keep in mind that this version of Ivy Bridge that we tested against was the quad core variant uh, that, and they haven't released the dual core variant yet either. So, uh, you know, there's, there's still a lot of testing and evaluation to be done to really get a, a final answer on Trinity. I have to say that the, the GPU performance um, while still better than the HD 4000 wasn't, as much better as you would kind of expect, right? So uh, the HD 4000 graphics on the Intel Ivy Bridge processor were a pretty big upgrade from Sandy Bridge. And because of that, Intel, or AMD's advantage on the GPU side, on the integrated graphics side, has been minimized a little bit. It's still there. It's still the best integrated graphics processor you can buy. But it's, it's, it's maybe less impressive than it was a year or two ago. Ouch. How impressive is the DV Nation Ramrod PC? Is this one of your 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 latest test beds you guys have gotten in? It's the uh, 64 gigabyte DDR3, 480 gigabyte Revo drive, three times two. This this looks like it's going to be a very expensive and very fast machine. <laughs> yeah, so this is one we're we're still in the middle of doing some testing on. It's a fifty four hundred dollar computer, which is obviously pretty steep. Uh, but they're billing it as like <laughs> <laughs> they're billing it as like. The, sto- the most storage performance you can get out of a computer stock, right? So it's got, it's got a Sandy Bridge E platform. Uh, it's, based, it's got 64 gigs of DDR3 memory. So it's got the maximum amount of memory that the system will, will physically handle, that those, that processor will handle. Um, but 42 gigs of that is configured into a RAM disk that's rated at 8,000 megabytes per second. So, you know, the, the idea is... For the person who needs the absolute fastest storage capacity, you have this 400, this, this 42 gigabyte drive essentially that shows up as a disk that's mm-hmm. rated at RAM based speeds. I mean, it's just totally, you know, out of the water in terms of storage performance. And then, you know, the issue with RAM, you can do a RAM disk. If you have a lot of memory on your own system, there's software that allow you to do that. But one of the benefits that this system has is it uses an OCZ Revo Drive, uh, Revo Drive 3, a 480 gig PCI Express based solid state drive. So that's, again, just just performance like none of us have really ever seen. The, the benefit of having the RAM disk and the PCI Express SSD is the, when you shut down your machine, using a RAM disk, it has to copy all the data from the RAM disk to storage in order for it to be a disk, right? You don't, if you just turned it off and it all got erased every time, that wouldn't be very useful. And then every time you boot up your machine, all that data has to be copied back into that memory so that you can access it at that speed. So by keeping the, um, the, the RAM disk kind of allocation space on this PCI Express based SSD, it happens very, very quickly, much faster than if you're backing up to an SSD, a standard SSD, or especially to a standard hard drive, right, to back up 42 gigs uh, of data every time you wanted to do it. So there, that's the plus. Plus, then you get the rest of the performance of the PCIe SSD for, like, your boot drive and stuff. And then it's got a pair of uh, uh, Seagate Momentus 750 <laughs> gig hybrid hard drives just because, I guess, it's, for your long-term storage, it also has... SSD uh, technology enable it in it. So this is, I mean, it's it's a it's a really small vendor, you know, and and they're doing something. They're doing they're they're going after a really niche market, you know, the, the people that need a fifty four hundred dollar 
just storage powerhouse machine, whether those be video editors, whether those be, you know, 2K video editors, 4K video editors, those types of things. Those are the kind of people that would utilize systems like this as well. So, uh, you know, we're, we'll, we're going to take a look at it and see, see what else it can do. It's got a HD 6990 in it, so it's got some gaming power too, uh, although they're updating the, the, the 690, they told me as well. So, yeah, if you've got that $6,000 and you don't want to buy a car, uh, you can buy stuff like this. While we're uh, talking about uh, buying things that we maybe not can't can not afford, not can afford yet, uh, <laughs> I, I was thinking that one this is a really cruel title: "Plug and Pray PCI Express SSD" that you can upgrade uh, OWE's to be OWC's Mercury Excelsior, uh, spelled A C C E L S I O R. Ridiculous name, very interesting product. If you take a look at the the picture down there, it's essentially a uh, PCI Express based SSD drive that starts at 120 gigabytes for 359. But if you'll notice, um, it's using uh, the toggle mode, MLC flash, um, basically the Toshiba, uh, uh, Toshiba memory. And then the card itself is pretty much a RAID card and you can snap in larger modules. What's really cool about this is uh, OWC told uh, PC Per that you should be able to boot it on Macs and PCs without having to use any third party drivers. Um, this is really interesting because if you, if you start, if you go to the link over on uh, the website there, it's kind of funny. You look at it like 120 gigabytes is $357, which is ridiculous for a 120 gigabyte drive until you remember the idea that you can expand this thing down the road um, with additional modules. I don't think that they are actually selling the additional modules yet. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, this, this takes like a right. form factor that maybe Apple created or helped create and kind of applies it in a way that the average user maybe when this kind of hopefully this could this this card will come down in price that form factor will come down in price and you'll be able to just kind of you know use it as your everyday type system i'd also like to see it go from a pci express by one connection to like a by four or something so that you you know as you expand your capacity as you expand the uh the ssds that you're actually using on it that you might actually be able to get some better performance as well but it's a, it's a it's a neat idea so we wait with bated breath to see if it's still around. Because the worst thing about buying something like this is when you're finally ready to upgrade uh, and whether or not the modules that will fit uh, with your device are actually available. Not a big deal if you're talking about most memory technologies. Most. <laughs> not right. all, but most. Um, but occasionally you can kind of get zapped, which can be really, really frustrating. But yeah, 960 gigabytes for $2,079. So... Uh, MP, I guess MP, MPCIE uh, SSD should be pretty common, but only time will tell. Indeed. Should we take a moment to thank our friends over at Squarespace? Yeah, we definitely want to do that. Uh, Squarespace.com, everybody, you guys know who these people are. Uh, you, you've been around uh, the Twit Network this week in computer hardware as well. They are the fast and easy way to create a high quality website or blog squarespace.com uh, is the place to go for that. It has a, it, it's a, it's a, it's not a blogging platform. It's an entire website platform. They have all kinds of great features. Uh, they have an easy-to-use user interface for creating and managing your website or blog. You don't have to be a gearhead uh, to, to, to figure out how to build a website on this. Uh, they did recently start giving out free domains to all annual plan customers so that you never have to pay for your domain or worry about hosting it. It's all conveniently integrated when you sign up and requires zero configuration uh, by making the domain selection and mapping completely seamless. Even if you decide to cancel the service, that domain is yours to keep. So that's uh, that's actually really cool. Um, they have simplified its subscription plans and reduced pricing, now offering standard plans as low as eight dollars a month. So if you want to, if you've been wanting to try out a, a website for any purpose, I think eight dollars a month is uh, about as cheap as you're going to get, especially for the quality of services that you're going to get here. Uh, Squarespace is optimized for both beginners and CSS experts, featuring a developer-friendly CSS editor that allows you to pop out the entire window in full screen, colorize code, undo, find, and replace. But if you are not a coding person, they have hundreds of design templates to choose from, and you can customize any of them to fit your needs. So you could start with a with a with a 
a template and, and make small modifications, change colors, change images, change fonts, things that you would be able to do. And it has a really easy interface to do that. They have iPhone, iPad, Android apps for updating your blog on the go. Um, they use Google's complete web font library. Over 300 fonts are now integrated. They have online resources and a support team to give you help 24 hours a day. They even offer free live webinars to help you get the most out of your Squarespace site or blog. So they're not just going to take your money and run. They're going to try to help you um, have a good time and have success with your website as well, which I think is is really important. Uh, this all, It's an all-inclusive service. It includes uh, modules to build your website, like the blog module, form builders, if you want to get information from your users, Flickr photo displays, uh, Twitter widgets, social media buttons to connect your websites to Twitter and Facebook and those things, Google Maps integration. Uh, it also has website tracking, so you know how many times your site is viewed, and a built-in search engine optimizer, permission access handling, cloud architecture for speed and site stability. You should use... Squarespace for all of your website needs. Build it, host it, and update it anytime. For a free trial, here's what you got to do. It's dead simple. Squarespace.com. Just go to squarespace.com, sign up for a free account. No credit card is needed. Just try it out. Start building your website. And then when you decide to purchase it, use the offer code TWITCH5, T-W-I-C-H-5, and you'll get 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. And don't forget about free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. So uh, squarespace.com, offer code TWITCH5, T-W-I-C-H-5. And we thank Squarespace for their support of This Week in Computer Hardware. Thank you, Squarespace. Email us, people. We love to hear your emails. Twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twit.tv. So we uh, start out with uh, Damien's question about Ivy Bridge temperatures. Absolutely. It's been interesting. Uh, if, if you play around in the forums, if you've been following Ivy Bridge, there's a lot of people absolutely freaking out about the temperature of Ivy Bridge processors. Uh, Damien writes in, Hey, guys, I was just wondering what you think about the Ivy Bridge temps. Do you know if this is why Ivy was delayed, or do you think they did it on purpose to separate the mainstream stuff from the enthusiast chips? Um, and it's been really, really interesting. Um, some people are saying that certain software applications, and, uh, and one, hey, Damien, thank you for the letter. Um, some people are saying that, that some temperature software hasn't been updated to correctly read the information coming off the uh, Ivy Bridge motherboards, Ivy Bridge compatible motherboards. Uh, but it's interesting. If you take a look... Uh, we we talked about the fact that you have a lot of transistors in a die shrink, so you're concentrating a huge amount of heat uh, in a smaller space than on Sandy Bridge. But there's a really interesting article on PC Watch, and the original article is in Japanese, <laughs> which is enormously <laughs> difficult to read. Um, so uh, Tech Power Up uh, did a pretty good uh, summary of what's going on there, and the 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 folks at PC Watch actually took off. The TIM, which is the sort of uh, the thermal interface, uh, I want to say thermal interface module, is that right? A thermal interface metal. Um, basically material. took the cover, material, thank you, took the cover off the chip, applied their own, and dropped temperatures by, quote, as much as 23%. Uh, and yeah. then uh, by swapping in a more efficient TIM, uh, uh, they were able to overclock the chip uh, and sustain higher core voltages to facilitate higher clock speeds. Um, and the idea is that some people are basically like, oh, uh, you know, Intel just made it really cheap and they didn't have to. Uh, legit reviews has a pretty good summary of it, too. Uh, what they look at, uh, they kind of look at overclock benchmark temperature performance, and they also go to cite the PC Watch article. Um, and it was really interesting to look at this, um, you know, where they're basically the by replacing the TIM, uh, the load temperatures dropped by 11 degrees Celsius at stock settings, which is a pretty healthy drop. Um, yeah, that's a lot. Uh, and then uh, running at uh, 4.6 gigahertz, the Core i7-3770 dropped to 20 degrees Celsius. Um, so it's an interesting, uh, you know, in Sandy Bridge, the core and the heat spreader were actually soldered together. Uh, and in this case, they basically used thermal paste, covered basically thermal paste goes from the chip to the heat spreader the heat spreader is essentially that black stuff you see around there's that black stuff you see around there is essentially the glue that's holding the heat spreader um the thermal interface material it's just it's a really i bet it i bet it's inexpensive i bet it's fast uh i don't think it's probably the best 
thing from a thermal or performance perspective. And I wonder how many people right now, the really serious uh, overclocking enthusiasts, are wondering if it's time to pop that thing off uh, and cobble together their own uh, heat sink on there. Um, um, I, yeah. I do not uh, have <laughs> the guts to do that, I guess. I mean, that could be um, an ex- I, I can remember, remember the, the AMD CPUs where they, they were basically extraordinarily fragile. And if you applied a heat, yeah. if you basically put the heat sink down improperly on the CPU, you can actually chip a corner of the CPU and render it useless. Yeah. Um, I don't great. think these are that sensitive, but you know, I'm sitting there like imagining taking my brand new three hundred dollar Intel thirty seven seventy, and yeah, look, <laughs> get, <laughs> get your uh, get your hobby knife out, kids, or get the hobby knife uh, and start hacking away. Um, props to the to the 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 fine people at PC Watts for pulling it, that. It actually off. makes me wonder. Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if, uh, in the span of the next month or so, we start seeing chips uh, come out where people are reporting lower temperatures, and that Intel fixes this problem in their production um, at some point. Right? They realize that they're getting a lot of negative feedback, and let's spend the extra twenty cents per chip and uh, use not crap uh, as a thermal interface. So well, it's kind of funny because they basically they put the tin back down just with an improved thermal compound. Like they look at OCZ Freeze Extreme Liquid Pro. Uh, if you look at the PC Watch uh, site as you're digging around there in Japanese, it's kind of funny. Like OCZ Freeze Extreme shows up in English. Um, but yeah, I think it's I think it's really curious because the the thing to remember here is that you know the thermals are high. Uh, a lot of people think the thermals are high, but they are they were they are within the thermal design, the TDP, the total uh, power sure. dissipation. Although, if you look at the boilerplate for some earlier processors, where they were, you know, where basically it came down to it's, you know, everything should be fine as long as you put enough, you know, if you put a big enough heat sink and a big enough fan on the heat sink, everything will be fine. Except in extreme cases when it's not fine, but. For the most part, most users in most situations, as long as you're not, you know, gaming in Arizona in 120 degree heat, everything would be cool. Like when you start reading the boilerplate for the for the TDP on on chips, it can get really really funny. Um, but it's basically Intel basically says 77 watts when you look at the Core i7 3770, and you know you start digging around, and it mentions nothing on temperatures. Um, but the nice thing about the modern processors is if they get too hot, they start backing off on performance to lower the amount of heat they're generating uh, until they freak out and just shut down right. before there's any damage. So, yeah, agreed. It'll be it's, interesting. It's an interesting situation, and, and, and we'll just have to see how, how Intel kind of responds to it. What they, if they change anything on their side, I'll, I'll be curious. If, I'll be surprised if they don't, I guess I'll say. <laughs> uh, let's take an email from Matthew on the poor state of GPU transcoding. It says, perhaps you guys could comment on this. And he links to a slash dot story uh, titled The Wretched State of GPU Transcoding. <laughs> uh, also, when Patrick records Twitch at the Twit office, there is a big gear hanging on the wall behind him. Is it decorative or real? We'll answer that, that short part fault first. Well, it's decorative. <laughs> I don't think it actually turns anything inside the office. So, yeah, I'm going to go with that. Can we, pull, um, can we get a shot of that, Chad? I don't, I don't yeah, think we made it. Let me get that one second. <laughs> um, Chad, so, I'm talking, I, I guess we're talking about the big, the big, um, the one behind here. it. Yeah, here, yeah, we're, we're going to, where Patrick sits. Yeah, we're going to go a little bit mobile here. I have to actually run over and grab it. So, one second. You guys keep vamping. Okay, I'll read the I'll read the summary on Slashdot here of the wretched state of GPU transcoding. It says uh, the story began as an investigation of why Cyberlink's Media Espresso software produced video files of wildly varying quality and size depending on which GPU was used for the task. It then expanded into a comparison of several alternate solutions. Our goal was to find a program that would encode at a reasonably high quality level, uh, something around a one gig per hour was the target, and require a minimal level of expertise from the user. The conclusion after weeks of work and going blind staring at enlarged images is that the state of consumer GPU transcoding is still a long, long away from prime time use. In short, it's simply not worth using the GPU to accelerate your video transcodes. It's much better to simply use Handbrake, which uses your CPU. Yep. Uh, Patrick, do you have any kind of experience with this? Oh, I do. Uh, some of the most miserable experiences uh, of my adult life have been dealing with transcoding files that we generated 
Uh, I, I don't really have to deal with that uh, at Revision 3 uh, generating Texilla, but back when I was doing DLTV for Ziff Davis, um, I ended up having to deal with all of the encoding, uh, which was painful because we had some pretty expensive professional-grade encoding tools that would crash. Basically, you kind of had to figure out which tool would render rich format with the least amount of pain. You know, and there was always people who were like, you should use this open source rendering tool. Um, but it's funny because the, the original article here is up on Extreme Tech on the, on the right to state of GPU transcoding. And it's a really interesting read because, you know, the, the primary comparison here, quote, is between uh, Zilsoft's Ultimate Video Converter, ArcSoft Media Converter, and Cyberlink's Media Espresso. Um, you know, other alternatives are included. And the goal, they say initially, it's a great article, like, was to include quality assessments on three separate sources, but none of these three solutions were able to properly encode our 30 gigabyte Blu ray rip of Lord of the Rings. Uh, Media Espresso was able to run the video, but not the audio. ArcSoft simply crashed. Zillisoft's audio was distorted. Data on the encoded file when one was actually created is still included here as it sheds light on how these programs handle different workloads. They basically came up, uh, the sort of like the, sh the short, the, the summary of this article is use Handbrake, uh, which I could have told you <laughs> going into this. Yeah. Handbrake is free. It's efficient. It doesn't use the GPU, and a lot of people, you know, get upset because Handbrake or other open source tools don't use the GPU. But what's really unfortunate about the whole sort of, you know, offloading the encoding to the GPU thing is in, all too often it's turned into an excuse for developers to hack their way to faster results. And a lot of the times the results look, um, to use a professional uh, television for instance, like ass. You know what yeah. I mean? Like there's, there's nothing worse than taking, you know, I reduced my file size by 70%. Cool. Okay, we're going to reduce the file size by 70%. We're going to be 50% faster than our competitor. And what they don't actually do is look at the results of that video. So, um, one, video transcoding is hard. Two, it's because of the way video is encoded, it can get squirrelier and squirrelier the larger it is. The audio formats can be really difficult. Um, I'm not surprised they had so much trouble. Uh, I am pleased that uh, the folks at Extreme Tech basically pointed out to just skip using these tools and use Handbrake. Um, yep. but it's unfortunate, right? Because I, I think the problem is, is most of these companies, they're dealing with a lot of GPU options, not a lot of time to test, a huge amount of difficulties with the source content. And, you know, go open source, get Handbrake, uh, and take advantage of the fact that CPUs are ridiculously powerful these days. Uh, that's that's kind of the smartest thing I can say. Because on the professional side, the whole GPU encoding has never really worked out the way anybody's wanted it to. Yeah, we... We we use uh, Adobe you know CS5 and we don't use the GPU for encoding because it either produced poor results or was not faster than the CPU um, and we're using a high super high end CPU obviously um, but you know and we do a lot of video encoding so if we're not and 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 I deal with hardware all day so if if I'm not comfortable enough just like hitting go and actually seeing an improvement on it then it doesn't surprise me that even with all the software options and hardware options they looked at they didn't see any. Uh, real need to use it either. So kind of disappointing. Uh, let's see. One you want to talk about the gear? Yeah, huh. yeah. Show that again. So this gear, um, I guess he was asking about, um, uh, it is, it is you know, quote, fake. Um, it doesn't, you know, do anything. Um, it, I think, believe it's made out of styrofoam. Um, but the really cool part about it is the paint job. Um, the paint job was probably the most expensive part of that gear to make it look so rustic and not... Like it's made out of. Um, they did a good job. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has a very cool metallic. Like when you throw lights on it, it it, it bounces uh, light like metal, that sort of stuff. Huh. And then also, um, uh, in terms of what we do here at Twit with the video encodes, uh, we use FFmpeg or Handbrake. We haven't decided on which one, uh, <laughs> and we're we're starting a new uh, encode machine. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's just kind of what we do. Don't, don't use GPUs, I guess, is what we're No, saying. yeah, I mean, yeah, that, that's about, yeah, what I'm saying is that there really is no GPU uh, alternative, so CPU all the way. Let's, well, um, yeah. another email here maybe from uh, James, when try that one, Patrick. Sure. James Bright Sandy says, big fan of the show. Thank you, James. I have a quick question on processors. I'm looking at building a system around either an i7-3930K or an i7-3770K. I'm jealous. I already have two stamps on 830, 128 
gigabyte drives that I plan to put in a RAID 0. Only interested in the performance. I don't care about reliability. Yes. An EVGA GTX 670 SC on the way. 32 gigs of Corsair XMMS DDR3 1600 RAM. A Kingwin Laser 1000 PSU, which is a lot of power supply for that rig. This machine will mainly serve as my lab machine where I'll run various virtual machines. I also plan on doing a decent amount of gaming on it as well. I plan on adding another graphics card in the future, probably another an EVGA, excuse me, probably another EVGA GTX 67 SC. What I'm hoping is I will not have to build a new PC for at least a couple of years. What processor chipset do you think offers the most value? I'm going to guess that Mr. Shroud's going to say the 3770K. Uh, yeah, because of the last word of the sentence, right, is really kind of the key there is right. value. Because you can get a 3770K for 300 and something dollars, and the 3930 is going to be 500 and something dollars. So you're going to save 200 bucks, and you can get um, better quality motherboards or let's say similar high quality motherboards for a little bit less money on the Z77 platform than you can on the X79 platform today. The only, the only thing that's... Um, might be interesting here is uh, lab machine was running various virtual machines. You know, the 3930 is a six core processor and the 3770 is a four core processor. So, uh, you know, if you're doing lots of virtual machines, you know, at the same time, if, if, if you're running six at a time or something like that, it, you may actually see performance benefits uh, of the 3930. You're already going to run 32 gigs of memory. And so if you do, you can do that more easily with the, with the 3930K in the X79 platform because you get um, six, do you get six? No, you get eight DIMM slots for a lot of those motherboards. So you could use four gigabyte modules instead of eight gigabyte modules that you would have to use on the Ivy Bridge uh, Z77 platform. Um, however, I still think I, if it were me today, I would probably still buy the 3770K over that uh, and uh, just be, I guess, maybe kind of pick a motherboard, maybe check around, um, you know, from Asus MSI or Gigabyte and check for your kind of like memory qualifications and maybe specifically buy eight gigabyte modules that um, will, that they've already kind of tested and, and, and you know work with that platform. Because anytime you get to the maximum memory size of, of, uh, of memory control, you, you sometimes you're hit or miss on that. So make sure you double check on that. But other than that, yeah, I, I think I would go with the Ivy bridge base platform and uh, Hey, nice system build by the way. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be a ridiculously fast system. <laughs> I think it's going to do it for this episode of This Week in Computer Hardware. Do us a favor, email us when you get a chance. We'd love to hear what you're interested in. We'd love to answer your questions. The email address is twitch, T-W-I-C-H, at twit.tv. And uh, you mentioned some, some more benchmarking coming up for PC Per starting tomorrow. Is there anything you can tell us about? Or do you have that um, gorgeous $5,500 $5, $5, system down there in Austin with you? I do, I do have that here. Um, I just got these in today, and I'm really eager to try these out. I was hoping they'd be charged by the time uh, the show started, but they were not. Um, these are brand new Corsair Vengeance. Um, let's see if I can show these on there. Corsair Vengeance 2000. Mm -hmm. Headsets, so they're wireless headphones, um, but they are supposed to use a very high bandwidth interface so you don't get any of the, maybe you get less kind of degradation because of wireless. Um, so I, I'm eager to try these out. And they've got memory foam ear cups and 50 millimeter drivers. Um, so I'm, I'm eager to give them, a, give them a try this week. That's going to be my thing because I still don't have external speakers set up anywhere here except for the ones integrated on this laptop, which are not that great. So yeah. And the motherboards and processor testing going on as well too. So how about on uh, Techzilla? Uh, we've got uh, some fun stuff coming up next week. I finally got uh, a Bluetooth OBD2 reader, which cost me a whopping $17 off of Amazon. I'm going to hook that up to my iPad and see how ridiculous I can get with doing sort of virtual uh, gauges on a uh, tablet. Um, we're going to be explaining what exactly these stupid numbers on the new CFL and LED light bulbs actually mean because you want a 60 watt light bulb, Just but it's telling those. 400 lumens. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting kind of thing because uh, it's a question I've been getting from a lot of family members. Uh, Lloyd Case is going to be on talking about uh, some computer hardware questions. Uh, Veronica is bringing in the Fitbit Aria, which is like a Fitbit except it's a scale, so I expect a lot of weeping 
on set mostly for <laughs> is, is healthy and trim. I am probably going to be terrified with the results. And uh, Yeah, I feel you there. We're going to be talking about uh, also next week uh, Dropbox security, about encrypting your Dropbox or box contents if you have an uptight IT department. And uh, Synergy, I think, is going to be a demo, which is a really interesting. It's like a KVM, uh, keyboard mouse switch, except it runs... And essentially, it runs off of a little server that runs off your main system. And then simply by dragging your cursor, you can move uh, the, the PC or Mac or Linux box. You can rotate between them by basically dragging the cursor across the row of monitors huh. on the desk. So cool. it's fun. It's going to be a little bit open sourcey next week, I, I suspect. <laughs> <laughs> so that is it for this week in computer hardware. I'm Patrick Norton. I'm Ryan Trout. We'll see you next week on Twitch.